Every five minutes, an American dies from a drug overdose. This wasn't the case 20 years ago, so what's been going on in the US? Let's talk about it. Hello, servus, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Feli. I'm originally from Munich, Germany, but I've been living here in Cincinnati, Ohio, on and off since 2016. And as many of you know, I live together with my boyfriend, Ben, who is American. And when we're out running errands or go downtown, Ben often says things like, this person's tweaking, implying that they might have a drug problem. Or we've had cases before where we sold something on Facebook Marketplace, and after the buyer picked it up, I said something like, she didn't look too well, and Ben immediately responded, yeah, she was on meth. Which is something that, even after living here for over seven years, I still wouldn't recognize. Probably because it's not something I grew up with. I mean, I can tell if someone looks somewhat sick, but I wouldn't be able to tell if those are signs of a drug addiction and what kind of drugs. Ben, on the other hand, grew up in a rural town in Kentucky and has been exposed to topics like pill abuse, drug addictions, and people overdosing pretty much his entire life. Before I ever moved here, I knew that the US had a bigger drug problem than Germany, and I had heard of terms such as opioid crisis and the war on drugs before, but I didn't really think that it would be a topic that I personally would be in touch with a lot. In my mind, this was something that took place in major cities like New York or LA, or when you hang out with the wrong crowd. Well, I was wrong and shocked. That's why I've briefly talked about this topic in my video about five things that shocked me in the US, and some of the things you heard me say in that video I'm gonna say again, but today we'll dive a lot deeper into the issue. Since the year 2000, more than one million people have died of a drug overdose in the US. Last year alone, between May of 2022 and May of 2023, there were an estimated 111,355 overdose deaths, which marks the highest number in US history within a 12-month period. Given that the US has a population of 332 million, that's about 33 overdose deaths per 100,000 people. For comparison, in 2022, Germany counted 1,990 people that died from drugs. This number includes death by overdose itself, as well as from the long-term effects of drug consumption. Considering Germany's population is about 83 million, this comes down to about two drug deaths per 100,000 people. By the way, for the entire European Union, the number of the reported drug-induced deaths in 2021 was 6,166, and there are about 448 million inhabitants within the EU, so significantly more than in the US. So something is clearly going wrong in the US. Since 1999, the number of overdose deaths has more than quadrupled. The biggest spikes happened between 2019 and 2020, when the number rose by 30%, and then it rose again by 15% between 2020 and 2021. And about 75% of those overdoses involved an opioid, such as prescription painkillers, morphine, codeine, or heroin. And in the last few years, mainly fentanyl, a high highly potent synthetic opioid. About 2.7 million Americans reportedly suffer from an opioid addiction. The situation is so severe that in 2017, the opioid crisis, or also often referred to as opioid epidemic, was declared a public health emergency in the US. With all of the media coverage on this topic and dozens of news reports every week, it can be really tricky not to feel lost in the flood of headlines, which is why I like to use ground news to get a compact overview of all of the relevant news, compare how different media outlets have covered a story, and how political bias might impact the way they approach the topic. For this story about the rising number of overdoses involving fentanyl, Ground News has evaluated about 30 different sources. It shows me a quick summary and a list of the various headlines. And it's really interesting to look at the different angles here, like how some headlines are a little more dry and focused on numbers, in this case, the death rate for people under 40, while other headlines use more emotional language, like the overdose wave has 
gripped the nation. Ground News also shows me where the news outlets are on the political spectrum, who they're owned by, which can be relevant to identify if a publication could potentially profit from a specific narrative, and even how factually accurate their reporting usually is. One of my favorite features on Ground News is the blind spot that shows you which stories you may have missed because they were disproportionately covered on one side of the political spectrum, which I think is super relevant in today's world to make sure that we don't get sucked too much into our own personalized filter bubbles where we only consume the kind of information that we already know and that conveniently lines up with our pre-existing beliefs. It's important to get the full picture and fill that blind spot. I also have the browser extension installed, which I use all the time because this way I can see the breakdown even when I read articles outside of Ground News. So if you're also looking for more transparency in the news landscape and an easy way to stay up to date on current events around the world, you can try Ground News for free or subscribe to get full access to all features for only about $5 a month. And if you use my link ground.news slash Feli, you'll even get a 30% discount on the Vantage plan, which is the one that I have. Of course, the overdose epidemic is more than just numbers. In an episode called Opioid Wars of the documentary series Fault Lines, the journalist talks to a group of people that struggle with substance abuse. I mean, how many people do know someone that's died of overdose from everybody? And it's not only people in rehab facilities that raise their hand to this question. I've met a lot of people here in Cincinnati over the last seven years who know people who've died from an overdose. One of them is my boyfriend, Ben. Nine people in his age group that went to high school with him in Kentucky or that he met in college, friends of his, have died from a drug overdose. Some of them even while they were still in high school. This number has gone up by two since I talked about it in my last video about one and a half years ago. This part of the US was hit particularly hard by the opioid crisis. Ohio and Kentucky are both among the states with the highest numbers of drug overdose deaths in the country. But how did the US end up here? The origins of today's opioid crisis go all the way back to the early 19th century, and a lot of it actually took place in Germany. While the natural substance opium, which is derived from the opium poppy plant, Schlafmohn in German, had been used as a narcotic and medication for over 4,000 years, the German chemist Friedrich Sertürner was able to refine it in the year 1806 when he managed to isolate a substance from opium that he called morphine. It quickly became a popular medication to treat pain, anxiety, respiratory problems, tuberculosis, and menstrual cramps. During the American Civil War in the 1860s, morphine was commonly used to treat wounded soldiers, which led to many soldiers developing dependencies and addictions to the drug. After the war, this was referred to as soldier's disease. The way that opioids work is that they bind to so-called opioid receptors on cells located in the brain, spinal cord, and other organs in the body, especially those involved in feelings of pain, and therefore block pain signals between the brain and the body. In addition to that, they can also cause an intense euphoria or high for some people, which can be extremely addictive. Towards the end of the 19th century, in 1898, the German chemist Felix Hoffmann, who worked for the pharmaceutical company Bayer, was able to synthesize a new derivative of morphine that was supposed to be a non-addictive alternative. They called it heroin and marketed it as a cough suppressant. It was sold legally all over the world for years before it became clear how addictive the drug was. In 1910, the US passed laws that banned the non-medical use of opium and heroin. In 1924, heroin was outlawed completely in the US. By the way, only a couple of weeks before this, Felix Hoffmann was also part of the development of aspirin in the Bayer labs. I talked about that in these two videos. But German scientists didn't give up, and in 1916, two chemists at the University of Frankfurt, Martin Freund and Edmund Speyer, developed an opioid drug called oxycodone, with the idea that it would retain the pain-relieving effects of morphine and heroin, but 
again, be less addictive. In the US, oxycodone became widely available in the 1950s when the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, approved Percodan, which was a mix of oxycodone and aspirin. But shortly after this, in the 1970s, President Nixon started the so-called War on Drugs in the US, which targeted cannabis, cocaine, but also heroin and other opioids. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. During this time, people became more wary of opioids and their addictive nature, even the legal ones. So by the 1980s, doctors hardly ever prescribed them, even to patients who suffered from severe pain because they thought even the smallest dose would get people addicted. This is also referred to as a time of opiophobia. But through the 90s and around the turn of the millennial, the number of opioid prescriptions in the US rose dramatically. This is when opiophobia turned into opiophilia. And one of the main catalysts for this turning of the tide was this company, Purdue Pharma, who in 1996 introduced their new prescription opioid painkiller, OxyContin, and heavily marketed it as a safe option for pain treatment and as a way to improve the patient's quality of life. They even produced a film in 1998 called I got my life back, where they introduced seven patients who were taking OxyContin. Since I've been on this new pain medication, I have not missed one day of work, and my boss really appreciates that. Lauren is there every day, so I'm able to be very productive. And one of the things that's really dear to my heart, and uh, which I'm especially um, excited about, is just the fact that I'm able to spend time with my grandchildren. It's amazing just to be able to keep up with them and not have to uh, always constantly tell them grandma can't play now, grandma can't do this, grandma's hurt and grandma's back hurts. This film was distributed to over 15,000 doctors across the country, by the way, and Purdue Pharma also always made sure to emphasize that the risk for addiction was actually extremely low. There's no question that our best, strongest pain medicines are the opioids, but these are the same drugs that have a reputation for causing addiction and other terrible things. Now, in fact, the rate of addiction amongst pain patients who are treated by doctors is much less than 1%. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects. And so these drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. Once you've found the right doctor and have told him or her about your pain, don't be afraid to take what they give you. Often, it will be an opioid medication. Some patients may be afraid of taking opioids because they're perceived as too strong or addictive. But that is far from actual fact. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. Not only do we now know that this claim about the risk for addiction being less than 1%, unfortunately didn't turn out to be true at all, it also turns out that this number actually comes from a quite questionable source. And I'll let John Oliver explain this one, who, by the way, has three great pieces on the opioid crisis. I'll link those down below. Less than 1%. And I know it may seem like they are pulling that number out of their ass but they actually pulled it out of the letters to the editor section of the New England Journal of Medicine. Seriously, this is it. That paragraph is the whole thing. It wasn't peer reviewed and it was only about short term use of opioids in hospitals, but it became the main source for that 1% claim. And letters pages are not a solid source for information. One of the marketing arguments for OxyContin at the time was that unlike previous opioids, it came with a controlled release or extended release mechanism, meaning its content is being released steadily over the course of 12 hours rather than being released all at once, which was assumed to cause a lower risk for abuse and addiction and was therefore even supposed to be safe for long-term treatment. We doctors were wrong in thinking that opioids can't be used long-term. They can be and they should be. So in the late 90s and early 2000s, doctors started to prescribe OxyContin to surgery patients and patients who suffered from cancer and other pain intense diseases, but also to people with less severe issues like arthritis and backaches. From 1991 to 2009, prescriptions for opioid painkillers in the US tripled and reached a peak in 2012. Since then, the number of opioid prescriptions has been going down again, 
but in 2020, the so-called opioid dispense rate was still at about 43 per 100 persons. Meaning that for every 100 people in the US, there were 43 opioid prescriptions that year. While a lot of this seems to go back to the aggressive marketing of the pharmaceutical companies, another potential factor could be that at least some doctors actually profit from prescribing opioids. According to an analysis by researchers at Harvard University and CNN that looked at data from 2014 and 15, more than half of the doctors that prescribed opioids received a payment from pharmaceutical companies that make opioids. This applied to over 200,000 physicians with hundreds of them receiving six-figure sums and some even receiving over a million dollars. These payments are usually for speaking, consulting, training, and education, and they actually found a correlation between how much money a doctor was paid and how many opioids they were prescribing. I don't know if the money is causing the prescribing or the prescribing led to the money, but in either case, it's potentially a vicious cycle. It's cementing the idea for these physicians that prescribing this many opioids is creating value. Said Dr. Michael Barnett, assistant professor of health policy and management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'll link the full article in the info box below. While for some people, opioids might mean money and benefits, for many of the patients, a prescription for painkillers quickly leads to an addiction. Jamie had never used opioid painkillers until he was 21 years old and he got injured. I got crushed over the stern of a lobster boat. Um, I got released from the hospital with a script of Dilatinates, so I started taking them and it was over. It was, my life was completely gone after that, lost everything, my home my vehicle, you know, all the money I had. And it just... Once people became dependent on painkillers, they said they'd do almost anything to get them. Um, one time I, I was hurting so bad that I ended up punching a four by four and breaking all three of these fingers and this bone to get p p pain meds for my doctor. I did that several times. So you'd hurt yourself in order to Absolutely. go to a doctor? Absolutely. Nine just... teeth pulled out of my head for prescriptions. At the time, that's how to my To get a prescription. Yeah. I've been with like groups of people where they've taken like bats to their wrists. To Broke arms. Easily. And many people consume opioids as a recreational drug too. Just like alcohol and marijuana, taking opioids is something that many Americans experiment with, even adolescents. To bypass the safer controlled release mechanism and get an instant high, many people crush the pills and then snort them, smoke them, or mix them with water to inject them, which poses high risks for overdosing and other health complications. In Ben's community in Kentucky, a lot of the kids in his high school and countless other people in the region got prescription painkillers from a local pain clinic, even though there was no actual medical need. These places are commonly referred to as pill mills. Here's another example in West Virginia. This undercover video of Kermit's main pharmacy shows scores of people picking up prescriptions inside and at the drive through window. More than three million doses of hydrocodone were ordered by a Kermit pharmacist, James Woolley, in one year. It's true, three million doses to a town of 400 people. That's around 7,500 pills for every resident in Kermit. While this was a very extreme case, it certainly wasn't an isolated one. Lots of people would travel from far away to these pill mill pain clinics and the associated pharmacies to get pills for themselves, but also to sell them. In 2013, the owner of the clinic in Ben's community was arrested and later sentenced to 20 years in prison for drug trafficking, among other charges. This, however, left a large number of people, many of them teenagers and young adults, with an opioid dependency, but no access to prescription opioids anymore. So many of them turned to another opioid that they could get on the streets, heroin. And this is a very common pattern. In fact, four out of five people who use heroin switched over from misusing prescription opioids. So how many, if we start from this side, have moved from prescription drugs to heroin? Everybody. Yeah, and heroin is so much more cheaper. But it actually, with everyone, started with a prescription from a yes. doctor. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, mate. 
morphine. Uh, five calls. From 2010 to 2020, heroin use has gone up by almost 50%, while deaths caused by a heroin overdose were almost four times higher. And in the last few years, there's been a new substance that has made the situation in the US even worse because it's a dangerous mix of being highly potent, cheap, and readily available, the synthetic opioid fentanyl. It's a hundred times more potent than morphine and 50 times more than heroin. Fentanyl is now involved in two thirds of all overdose deaths, most of which go back to illegally made fentanyl rather than pharmaceutical fentanyl. Fentanyl is killing more than 70,000 Americans a year. That means that about 200 Americans die from fentanyl every day. And many other drugs such as heroin, cocaine, meth or counterfeit prescription painkillers are being cut with fentanyl because of its low price and high potency. That's also what makes this drug so extremely dangerous. Even in small doses, as low as two milligrams, it can be deadly. And especially when people don't even know that they're taking fentanyl, an overdose can happen very quickly. As a result, this nasal spray with the brand name Narcan that can quickly reverse an opioid overdose has become one of the most important tools for first responders. So every single firefighter in the Revere Fire Department knows how to use this, has been trained on this. Has yeah. used it. Mostly. Yes. We, and has used it. Yes. Uh, from the chief down, we tend to have more overdoses than we do Fire. Fires. So it's a piece of equipment that we can't go without now, just like we have the hose. Even libraries across the US are stocking up on Narcan because a lot of them have had people overdosing in their yards and inside their buildings. Since it's almost impossible to tell if drugs have been laced with fentanyl, it can be life saving to use fentanyl test strips before consumption. They're pretty cheap and can provide results within five minutes, so even if you just do party drugs such as ecstasy or cocaine, you should always make sure to test for that. However, the CDC says that these strips might not be able to detect more potent fentanyl-like drugs such as carfentanyl. So just in general, it's more important than ever these days to be extremely wary of what you take and ideally just don't take anything, please. In the US, you can also get the anti-overdose nasal spray Narcan over the counter, by the way. I actually just bought that myself because you never know what you might run into and you might be able to save a life with this. The German public broadcasting channel Steuerung F actually published a documentary about the fentanyl crisis in the US just a few weeks ago. I'll link that down below for the German speakers among you. The reporter went to Portland, Oregon, where drugs were decriminalized in 2020 to take a look at the situation on the streets. And honestly, even I, as someone who lives in an American city, was shocked when I saw this. I mean, you do see a lot of homelessness and poverty in all American cities, but I hadn't encountered anything comparable to what the reporter is showing in downtown Portland. Are you taking drugs yourself? Um, I occasionally eat, yeah. What kind of? Fentanyl. But why fentanyl? Because it's an opiate and I couldn't afford the oxys or the heroin at the time. It was just, and when fentanyl came on the streets, it's all, it's the only thing that was around. But you're not afraid to die? I mean, by overdose? Of course I'm afraid to die. Now, if you're wondering how it got to this point. The main area that we can improve on and the approach that's available to every doctor with a prescription pad is just for us to do a better job of prescribing strong pain medications and I mean opioids. I got my life back now. Now I can enjoy every day that I live. I look at the future the same way uh, uh, um, a young guy, 25, 30 year old would. I mean, I got the whole world in front of me now. At the end of the day, two of the people that appeared in Purdue's I Got My Life Back film ended up developing an opioid addiction and passed away. Even Lauren, who we saw earlier, ended up struggling with addiction. Eventually I lost my job and lost my health insurance. And so I could no longer, my medical insurance uh, didn't have prescription drug, you know, insurance anymore. So this was out of pocket expenses for me. I lost my house. <laughs> oh yeah, I've lost cars, I've lost, I lost a lot, a lot. I don't, I've lost a lot to keep um, behind taking that drug when I did lose my job. Mm -hmm. Had I not lost my medical insurance, or as I said, if I was to go to the mailbox once a month and I would find a bottle of Oxycontin in it, I'd probably still be on it and I'd probably be dead. I'd probably be dead. 
What's shocking to me is that there still doesn't seem to be a whole lot of sensitivity for this issue in doctor's practices. I even experienced this myself when I broke my wrist three years ago and needed to get surgery here in the US. Granted, this was three years ago, maybe something has changed since then, but here's my experience. This was an outpatient surgery, so I went to the hospital, had the surgery, and then was sent back home the same day. I was still very loopy when I woke up from the anesthesia, but I was told that I was going to pick up my painkiller and an antibiotic at the pharmacy, and I was told how often I should take those, so that's what I did. On the first day after the surgery, I felt extremely weak, dizzy, and pretty nauseous, but I thought that was just the after effects from the anesthesia. But when by the second or third day, I'm not quite sure anymore, I was still feeling like that and didn't really manage to eat more than a banana a day, my parents got a little worried and pointed out that that didn't really seem to be normal. And that's when I looked a little bit more into what I was actually taking. Percocet, a combination of oxycodone and acetaminophen, aka paracetamol, and together with oxycontin and Vicodin, one of the most commonly prescribed opioids. My prescription said five 325 milligrams every six hours as needed. The thing is, I was definitely not fully there right after the surgery, so maybe I just forgot, but at least as far as I can remember, I wasn't really informed about the risks of taking opioids or asked if I was even okay with taking one. Looking through my documents, I saw that they did give me an information sheet about opioids together with all the other documents from the hospital, but I honestly wasn't really capable of reading a whole lot after I got home. But when I finally did my research and read that many patients feel nauseous and dizzy on oxycodone, I decided to call the doctor and ask if it would be okay for me to stop taking it. I had a great doctor, by the way. He was great in all of the appointments. So I called the hospital and I talked to a nurse first, I think, and explained that I'm not doing too well with the medication and would like to ask if it's okay for me to stop taking it and just take ibuprofen or Tylenol instead. And then she handed me over to the doctor and before I could even finish explaining the situation to him, he already said something like, no problem, we can fill up your prescription. And I was like, no, 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 quite the opposite. I'd actually like to stop taking the painkillers if possible. And he seemed pretty surprised, honestly, and said, yeah, of course. And then I think he said that I could do either ibuprofen or Tylenol, both would be safe options. So I did that and the next day I felt 10 times better and my pain was almost gone too. Looking back, I almost feel like the opioids made me feel like absolute shit, but also didn't really help my pain a lot either because I was in a lot of pain those first three days. That's also why I kept taking those painkillers every six hours. And as soon as I took ibuprofen instead, it was pretty much gone. Maybe that was just because things had started to heal at that point, I don't know, but I truly wish that I had been given the option to take something more harmless, like an over-the-counter painkiller first, with the option to take something stronger if needed. But that wasn't even presented to me as an option, and seeing how quickly they were gonna give me even more of that stuff just shows how almost carelessly opioid painkillers are prescribed here. Now, of course, the drug problem in the US doesn't exist in a vacuum. Things like poverty, the accessibility of healthcare and education, the lack of stable support systems, drug use within the family, or peer pressure, among many other things, can all play a role and fuel drug abuse. And the US is taking measures to battle this overdose epidemic. In addition to things like methadone programs, needle exchanges, and substance abuse treatments, the Biden administration just announced an additional 450 50 million dollars in funding to beat the overdose epidemic and just a few weeks ago the government also announced sanctions and indictments against Chinese companies that import the chemicals to make fentanyl. Together with Mexican cartels, those are one of the main drivers in the fentanyl crisis. And a little win took place back in 2007 when Purdue Pharma and its top officers had to pay over 600 million dollars in fines for lying to the public about the risk of addiction regarding OxyContin. Later that same year, the state of Kentucky, which as I said was hit particularly hard by the opioid crisis, actually sued the company also for improper marketing. That case was settled in 2015 and the company had to pay $24 million. And then almost all US states, as well as thousands of individuals, jumped in and sued them as well. In the last few years, the Sackler family, who own Purdue Pharma, have been trying to negotiate their way out of this in a $6 
billion dollar deal that includes a bankruptcy filing and would grant the individual family members broad protection from any civil lawsuits related to the opioid crisis. But the Supreme Court actually just blocked that in August and set up a hearing for December. I would personally hope that those people would have to take a little bit more responsibility for so many lost lives. Other pharmaceutical companies like Cephalon or Insys that sell pharmaceutical fentanyl had to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in the last few years as well. Now, this topic is huge, of course, and there's a lot more to this than what I was able to cover in this video, but I do hope that this gave you an idea of what's been going on in the US and of the stories that take place right in front of my eyes here in the Ohio, Kentucky region. Feel free to share additional information, personal experiences, or opinions in the comments below. And if you enjoy what I do here on my channel, you can support me by sending me a super thanks, buying me a coffee, or becoming a Patreon supporter. I truly appreciate it. On on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, you can find some more content and insights into my life. So if you're interested in that, make sure to follow me there. And with that, stay safe, everyone. And I hope I'll see you next time. Cheers.